everyone. Uh, and welcome to this program honoring the memory of James W. McElhaney. Uh, I'm Jonathan Enton. I was Jim's colleague for many years and also am a former Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Law School. Um, Deans Jessica Berg and Michael Scharf wanted to be here this afternoon, but they can't. They are both out of town, and they asked, but they asked me to, uh, to convey their, their deepest regrets about missing this program. Uh, before we proceed into the program, let me introduce Professor McElhaney's son, Ben, um, his wife, Julie, and their daughter, uh, Sophie, uh, who have come up from Columbus uh, to be with us today. Um, and uh, Professor McElhaney's widow, Penny, uh, and uh, their other son, David, uh, cannot be here, but we are live streaming the program, so uh, we hope that they are able to join us uh, in real time. Um, so let's at least acknowledge uh, Penny and David's virtual presence. <laughs> Jim McElhaney was a member of our resident faculty for nearly three decades, and he retained his connection to the school uh, for many years beyond that. As you will hear from our speakers, Jim was a preeminent figure in trial advocacy. He created our trial program that lives on in our trial tactics course that he created, and our mock trial team, uh, which is having its team night uh, later this evening. Uh, Along the way, uh, Jim developed other courses, including Evidence for Litigators and other courses that you'll also be hearing about. Jim had a huge national profile. He was, for many years, the editor of Litigation Magazine, uh, a, and for a quarter century, he published a monthly column in the ABA Journal. On top of all that, Jim spoke frequently around the country. To give you a sense of his prominence, uh, my colleague Eric Jensen, uh, who would tell the story much better than I am about to, uh, uh, recounts a uh, time when he was visiting his in-laws in Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, his father-in-law introduced him to a local lawyer and told the man that Eric taught at Case Western Reserve Law School. The attorney instantly exclaimed, Jim McElhaney, and that for, uh, for many people was an important reality. For many lawyers in, around the country, Jim McElhaney was this law school. Today's speakers have connections with Jim in many roles, as colleague, student, admirer, or some combination uh, thereof. Each of them will share reflections, and at the end of the formal program, we'll invite anyone else who wants to add to the occasion to say a few words as well. Our first speaker is Thomas Garrity, the class of 1967 James B. Haddad professor at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. Tom Garrity was, for more than 35 years, Northwestern's Associate Dean for Clinical Education. And for more than 40 years, he was the director of Northwestern's Bloom Legal Clinic. Professor Garrity is still an active clinical teacher, and that means that although he wanted to be here with us, he couldn't travel to Cleveland this afternoon. Instead, he will be joining us by video feed from Chicago. We are honored to have Tom Garrity as part of the program. Despite 
being a, an ardent follower of Jim and uh, a, a student of his uh, teaching of trial advocacy, I've never been able to follow his uh, admonition or his advice to do away with, uh, with notes. I have to say that I, I failed in that respect. Now, I've been asked to give a few remarks because of my relationship with Jim when he was an active member of the faculty of the National Institute for Trial Advocacy, or NETA. And the focus of my remarks will be Jim McElhaney as NETA teacher and colleague. Now, by way of background, I attended my first NETA program uh, a long, long time ago, in 1973. It was the second national program at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And that was the time when NETA's founders and legendary, legendary trial lawyers, judges, and teachers were in attendance. And I just will mention a few names, perhaps they will be known to some of you in the audience. Jim Kerrigan, Bob Keaton, Prentice Marshall, Jim Jeans, Judge Irving Younger, and other luminaries such as Ken Brown, Jim Seconder, and Patty Bob were also there as teaching assistants. And in Patty's case, she was along with me as a student. Volunteer faculty members included Bob Hanley, Del Mitchell, Keith Roberts, legendary trial lawyer in Chicago, Eugene Pincham, and Frank Cicero. Now at that time, I'd been in practice for about three years and was just beginning to try criminal cases in the then new Northwestern Legal Clinic. But after attending that session in Boulder in 1973, I became a NETA devotee, attempting to implement learning by doing t teaching techniques at Northwestern and leading NEDA's Midwest Regional Program for 25 years. By the way, in which Cleveland leaders of the bar, including Robin Weaver, David Schaefer, and Judge Marcus taught. Um, I eventually taught in more regional programs and joined the NEDA's Board of Trustees. And in all of these capacities, I had quite a bit of contact with Jim over the years as colleague and as I hope a friend. Now to the best of my re recollection, and this is a phrase that rightly or wrongly comes up in the trial and litigation process, I first met Jim at an early national session of NETA, I think in 1973. He was senior to me, but even then, and even then a person of great accomplishment, but not at all intimidating. In fact, he was downright friendly conveyed to me, as he always did to his students, his dedication to teaching by reaching out, to listening, to being interesting and being and entertaining, and above all, enthusiastic about his chosen subject matter. And as, my, and as any master teacher must do, he listened to what you had to say, conveying genuine interest in how becoming better in the courtroom might contribute to your success as a lawyer, as a teacher, and as a citizen pursuing justice for clients. Now, to those of you who can't remember what legal education was like 50 plus years ago, these, these, were attributes, these attributes were not always at the fore back then. And it was Nita and educators like Jim who became the advocates and practitioners of this quote unquote new style of teaching. I can remember as I sat in one of Judge Irving Younger's lectures on evidence in Boulder, thinking, this guy knows how to make evidence interesting. And Jim adopted and carried on this tradition of effective teaching and communication. And he was a pathbreaker in that respect. And as a proponent and practitioner of what I'll call engaging communication, Jim influenced scores of students, and as importantly, scores of practicing lawyers around the country through his teaching in small groups and his widely renowned lecture. As the administrator of a large regional NEDA program, and we, also, we often had 125 plus students enrolled at one time in our Midwest regional program, I had a chance to observe Jim in small group settings with students in the lecture hall, and in the lecture hall. And there is no doubt that one of the reasons we had so many students in our Midwest Regional Program was because of Jim. He was a huge draw, and word got around very quickly that if you wanted to learn a lot about trial advocacy, you should attend the Midwest Regional Session of the National Institute for Trial Advocacy. And 
during the time that Jim taught with us in the Midwest Regional, I had the privilege of sitting in on his classes and listening to his um, lectures. I never tired of doing that. His teaching uh, in small groups was a model of NIDA teaching methodology in critiquing students, what's the headline, what's the playback, and what's the rationale. He was the best at being honest and constructive and even inspirational in what we call critiquing individual student performances. You could be a student who needed a lot of work, but after being taught by Jim, you felt that being an effective trial lawyer was an attainable, attainable goal. Jim's lectures were entertaining and instructive, and instructive, complete with relevant legal analysis, anecdotes, and stories. He knew that humor engaged the audience. He was funny without losing sight of the fact that his audience came to the program to be educated, not entertained. But as all knew him would agree, he was very entertaining, and that was in large matter, in large measure, the secret to his success. Another secret to his success, I believe, is that, at least in my opinion, he was a bit um, insecure and somewhat vulnerable. This made him reach out to others for the opinions about his work. And it made him uh, incredibly committed to achieve his goal of getting his, mes his messages across. He was never self-satisfied, he was never a self-satisfied person and he was always seeking to do better and to do that by getting critiques from students and faculty about his quote unquote performances. A few observations about why it was such a pleasure to, for me to work with Jim. As many of you know, participating in a NIDA program as a teacher and as a student is taxing. You are quote unquote on all day with students from eight to 5 p.m. In addition, you are assigned lectures and demonstrations throughout the week. Then there are the final trials at the end of the program, usually on a Saturday or a Sunday. For many years, and I think 15 to 20 at the Midwest Regional, Jim and other team leaders and faculty members enthusiastically embraced their assignments, even when, as was often the case in mid-January in Chicago, the weather was either bitterly cold, we had blizzard conditions, or both. Jim always soldiered on, no matter what the obstacles and no matter what his other substantial commitments were. There was nothing that I and others asked of him that he wouldn't do in pursuit of his profound commitment to learning, teaching, and inspiring others. His impact. I can only imagine, and I haven't counted them, and I don't know if anybody has, the number of students who hung on every word that he uttered in the small group sessions during which his interactions with, with students were so profound and during his lectures. The numbers are in the thousands. They remember Jim, and I know that they are grateful to him, as I am, for having had the privilege of being able to learn from him and to work with him and to consider him my colleague and my friend. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you about my friend and colleague, Jim McElhaney. I appreciate it. Thanks to, to Tom Garrity, who I believe is uh, has stayed on uh, the line so that he can hear the rest of the program. So thank you so much for getting us off to such a terrific start. Our next speaker is Mark McCarthy. Um, Mark is a longtime adjunct uh, here at the law school. He has been teaching trial tactics for more years than I can remember. Uh, and I want to welcome to the podium, Mark. Thanks. As usual, Garrity said everything I was going to say, so <laughs> I saw so Bill on it. Uh, I apologize. Uh, stories are going to run into stories. Dates are going to get wrong. Uh, you know, it's uh, the fog of war and uh, dancing age, I guess. But uh, I probably met uh, Jim somewhere around 1982 or the mid-1980s. 
he walked into a medical malpractice case I was trying against, I believe, Eric Kennedy. Uh, and he just sat and watched. He wanted to see one of his star students uh, in action. So um, I think, and Freddie Wiseman was sitting second chair behind Eric, uh, I think that was Eric's first seven figure verdict. Luckily, I wasn't on the other end of it. But uh, um, at some point after that, either Jim or Eric asked me if I wanted to help teach with them. Uh, and off I went. Um, Jim was, if I remember, he, he was born in Terrytown, New York, but very quickly they moved to uh, Wisconsin. Think Lake Wobegon. <laughs> uh, think of the fictional legal universe he created in his columns of Angus and uh, uh, Judge Stanwell and uh, Mudger my favorite guy, and uh, who was that guy that uh, looked at litigation as combat monger or something like that? Uh, I think he might have picked that up there. And as I remember right, his dad had been a salesman. His mom, I think, was a teacher, if I remember right. Uh, but uh, Jim's real passion was music before anything else. He used to talk about it. And I think some of what you saw in his free spirit and his uh, uh, imagination that he brought to teaching this craft uh, was based in that. Uh, that's what he liked to do. Uh, and that was an avocation of his. He really enjoyed music. Uh, if I remember right, uh, he wanted to go to, I think, Wisconsin, but he ended up going to Duke. Uh, and he went to Duke, and then Duke Law School. I think his older brother was at Duke, uh, and he followed him in to Duke. Uh, I, I think he had talked about wanting to be a doctor at one point, uh, but he went to Duke. And he came out of Duke, and he went to the Judge Advocate Court. And he was on, he was in New York, trying cases and consulting for four or five years, maybe less than that. But he walked in, if you know about the Judge Advocate Court, I mean, you're trying cases all the time. Uh, and I think he was doing it from both sides of the table. So he got to see what the pit looked like. Uh, and then he went back to Wisconsin, I think Milwaukee for a few years, was an associate at a firm, and that didn't last real well. I mean, he sort of didn't like law firms. I think it was less than a year. Uh, and somebody who had taught him at Duke offered him a job, I believe, at Maryland, and off he went. Uh, and he was there for a number of years, and then he went to SMU and honed his craft, and then lo and behold, this place called. Uh, and it was here that he really blossomed. I mean, it, it, and mind you, I think he started in 1976 here. No, is that right, 76? I think 70, that's right. 70, 70, Something, 70, 70. yeah, 76, 77. And there was sort of a resistance to that type of teaching, I think that would be an understatement. Uh, now there isn't, now it's the norm. We learn by doing, and doing is what he did. I mean, he was just a joy to watch work. It was a pleasure uh, sitting with him. And I want to talk about that a little bit, because I want to talk about the process that he used to teach. He was no button-down, cufflinked, um, paper chase lawyer using the Socratic method as a club to basically cower in students and to be forming as lawyers. No, 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 no. That's not what he did. He was a teacher with the students. It wasn't us and them, it was us. It was us. Uh, and he basically nurtured people along in a way that was uh, comforting, 
in a craft that was difficult, tension-filled, and absolutely nerve-wracking, to say the least, so that when somebody got out of his class, after he put those building blocks in one after another, they could walk into a courtroom comfortably and competently try a lawsuit to conclusion. They could put a jury in the box, they could try a case, they could do a closing statement, and take it to a jury. Uh, and once or twice a year, uh, as you were sitting next to him, there'd be a note on the table uh, from some student saying exactly that. Maybe they were one or two years out. I went today and I tried a case and I wasn't nervous. I knew what I was doing, uh, I was comfortable, uh, and uh, I took the case to verdict, and I lost. <laughs> or I won. Uh, and sometimes those, those that come in, those letters that come in 10 years out or so. Um, but to watch him do the building blocks was something that was, I think, instructional to all of us, because what he did by doing this 10-week process step by step was to build a brick wall where you knew how to do direct examination, you knew how to do cross-examination, you knew how to do an opening statement, and he truly believed that in many short cases, by the time you set the template with that opening statement, uh, they unconsciously in that jury box, if you won that, had decided where they were going to cubbyhole the evidence after that. Uh, so he paid a lot of attention to that. He paid a lot of attention to Bart Deer, too, which not many people do anymore. Uh, he also did something that was interesting. And coming from my background, uh, I was educated, I was raised by wolves. Those are Jesuits. Uh, so <laughs> He would infuse into every class he had, uh, quietly, uh, ethical problems. He would talk about those. Uh, he would talk about putting together uh, a set of moral values that he were going to approach the, pre the profession with, uh, a certain code of conduct that you used. Um, everybody had inherent dignity even when you were stripping them down on cross-examination bears to what their intent and motives were. I mean, he taught that. He emulated that. What we do is a sacred profession. He believed that. We are in the dispute resolution business, and this was just one of the tools that can be used to resolve disputes. There's a lot of things going up to that and a lot after it, but this was one of them. And the funny thing, actually it took me a while to watch this, was that if you didn't do what we do for a living, uh, if you were a tax lawyer, a transactional lawyer, uh, in insurance or business, you took the skills that you learned in here and put them to work, taking a large set of facts, distilling them down to what was important and using those to persuade or using those skills to set up in a dispute in a way that was kind what the resolution points were so that you could get it settled with motions that would back somebody into a corner and create the issues that you wanted to create for the decision to be made. He did that very, very well. Um, and it was fun to watch. He did a couple other things, and Garrity talked about it. There was a video before they redid this courtroom, a, kind of a video thing over here behind this wall. Uh, and it was very unobtrusive. Uh, in fact, I don't think he told people this until the second week. <laughs> and I'm not sure he did that purposely or not. Uh, but he would videotape each person's performance, each class. And those would be taken upstairs and put in the library. 
so that you, and he insisted on this, so that you could take those out and see your progression during the 10 week period as to what your style was, as what your quirks were, as to what your ticks were, uh, and he would nurture that. He would nurture your style. You had a unique set of gifts. Every person was different. Every person couldn't do it that way. But by the time you were done, you felt that he knew what he got letters about, which is you could walk in and, and do this. He did that extremely well. Um, you know, I've done free eulogies in the past week, and you always write this stuff out, and you never uh, use it. But, um, the other thing he did uh, that I hadn't seen much when he is, uh, and I came, out of, I came out of Georgetown, where my final year at Georgetown, we were trying misdemeanor cases in uh, the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, which was a prelude to the Prettyman program, where you got a master's in uh, uh, trial advocacy. Messerman and Bob Maynard went through that program, who were here in town. Uh, but Jim had people work in teams. Uh, he would actually have people collaborate Imagine that. Not compete. Uh, and the business school people that were here really appreciated that because they were used to it from what they had learned in, in the business schools. Uh, and he would team people up on the exercises each week, too. You can collaborate on what you're going to do. And then, as Garrity said, his critiques were superb because he'd only, I don't know if this was a gym thing that went to Nita or a neat thing that went to Jim, he would pick out one thing which each student. It would be very basic for the first one, build for the second one, get more complex for the third one, so that by the time you walked out from that exercise each night, you had a very good template by watching your classmates as to what worked and didn't work, which was practical, which wasn't practical, which I thought was intriguing. Um, and really good. And then he put it all together in a final trial. Um, we've actually refined that so that we do a midterm now. It's always the same one. Where we'll match up six kids against six kids halfway through so they can see the progressions and how they build. Um, and they'll work with six. And then they'll refine it a little more. And they'll go two on two in the end. It seems to work a little bit better than I think maybe doing it all at the end. So what was it he was really doing? And I mean, he really took off when he started doing the litigation um, magazine stuff. Uh, Nita, of course. And then he freelanced for a while. And I was, he was flying around. Uh, and you know, you're right when you said Case Western Reserve Law School, you know, baffling. Uh, I traveled quite a bit. Uh, uh, I'm now doing immigration work at Catholic Charities, uh, which is really an eye opener. But, uh, uh, but I would travel a lot, and I go coast to coast. Um, and it was intriguing to watch how people treated each other in different states, especially on the coast. Uh, they didn't hear in Cleveland. They didn't hear in Ohio among the trial lawyers, and a lot of people said that it was, it was because of him, what he emulated when they, he was training them to do this work. This state, and I think the city, is a lot different because of the way he taught law. Uh, so uh, we should emulate that. We should continue to do this, uh, and we should support this school for allowing this to happen. I mean, this was the forerunner. This was the front of the envelope about what we do for a living. Uh, and I thank um, the administration here and the people that are sitting in this room. I mean, uh, he brought a loyalty. Is Arlene here? Where's Arlene? Oh. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, there was a certain loyalty among people that there's, uh, you know, the train ran on time. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it ran on time because Arlene was there, not only during Jim's tenure, but thereafter. Uh, you know, and I, you could go person after person after person about that, but thank you for keeping the train running. My pleasure. <laughs> so, that's it, thanks. Our next speaker uh, also uh, could not join us in person today. Um, that is Judge Kathleen O'Malley of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, she is a graduate of the school, uh, and when I invited her to be part of the program, she said that her schedule at the court made that impossible, uh, but she insisted on uh, preparing a video for us, uh, which arrived in, I think, no more than three days. Uh, here we go. First, I want to thank Case Western Reserve Law School, and more importantly, uh, Professor James Magler and his family for the privilege of being allowed to say a few words about you. I'm really sorry that I can't be there, and I would if I could, but I do want to take an opportunity to tell you a few things about Jim Magler. Of course, you're going to hear tons about his contributions to NIDA and his contributions to trial practice generally, and how many people learn things from him uh, and from his system of educating trial lawyers for many, many years. I want to talk to you about what it was meant to be a student of James McLean. I actually think that I have the record of taking more classes from James McLean than anyone else at Case Law School. I took evidence for litigators, and even though he made a show up five days a week at 8 a.m. for only three credits, I never missed a class, and I was so glad I did it. I also took advanced evidence for litigators, which he taught with a professor from the drama department, where he taught us all how to deal with specific things like evidence, but to do it with a little flair, which Jim himself was very good at. I then was on his mock trial team, the first ever mock trial team that Case started, and I spent a lot of personal time with him as he judged us and, and gave us advice and even traveled with us. I spent so much time with Jim McElhaney because I couldn't stop learning from him. And what happened going forward is something that I couldn't have even anticipated. I was a much better trial lawyer because of him. No one could up me on an evidence issue. I was a much, much better trial judge. No one could uh, get around me on an evidence issue. No one could fool me on an evidence issue. And very often, I would call people up to sidebar, and they would look at me. And after a couple of years, I got the reputation where they'd say, we assume you're right on this evidence. <laughs> and it was not because I was so brilliant. It was because Jim McElhaney taught me really well. So I want to thank him. I want to thank his family. I want to commemorate him and tell him and tell his family how much I loved him and how much he meant to me. Thank you. Just briefly uh, turn to uh, the role of speaker rather than moderator uh, to say a few things about Jim McElhaney as a colleague. I got to know Jim fairly well, even though I am neither a trial advocacy nor an evidence specialist. Uh, but let me give one example of my own work with Jim. Uh, 
I focused more on the appellate side of the law. Uh, so early on, I became involved with our moot court program. When I started, the Dunmore Moot Court competition was by far the largest student activity each year, attracting 80 to 100 students for a two semester program. And it was completely student run. Like any student program whose leadership changes every year, sometimes things didn't go as smoothly as we might like. As a result of one particularly bumpy year, the faculty decided to provide more guidance to the Moot Court program. So we created a working group that would offer a series of lectures to the Dunmore participants during the fall semester to make sure that they had a better foundation for the work of the competition. Jim McElhaney was an important part of that original faculty working group. There were about five of us, as I recall, um, some of whom are in the room with me. Uh, but most of us were constitutional law and civil procedure types who wanted to focus on grand notions like standards of review and constitutional theory and statutory interpretation and things like that. Jim had a much more down-to-earth emphasis. He wanted the students to understand that appellate lawyers, like trial lawyers, had to have a theory of their case and a way of telling their story to the judges on appeal, just as trial lawyers had to have a theory of their case and a way of telling their story to jurors at trial. So Jim put together an abbreviated but marvelously stimulating presentation for the Moot Court students that helped them grasp one of their most important tasks as lawyers. It was a real tour de force that left the students both awed and completely engaged, which is a lot more than could be said for the students when I was talking. Um, we did those programs for several years. They were the inspiration for what is now our year-long course in appellate practice, and the success of that course is due in no small measure to Jim's engagement and commitment. It wasn't only the students who learned from his lectures. Now, Jim also played an important role behind the scenes here at the law school. He chaired for many years the Appeals and Rules Committee. That committee handled student grievances and discipline problems of various sorts. Uh, to say that chairing Appeals and Rules is a chore would be an understatement. Jim probably was asked to chair that committee because of his extraordinary knowledge of the trial process. But the committee actually rarely held hearings on his watch. That was not because Jim uh, was a shirker, but rather because he worked assiduously behind the scenes to help defuse problems before they got out of hand. Several of my predecessors as academic dean have told me how much they appreciated his fine work in that role. I just wish he had still been here when I became academic dean. Um, it would have been a lot less hectic. Uh, he has set a standard, he set a standard there that has never been approached. Now, before we move on, uh, Mark McCarthy uh, earlier uh, said something about Eric Kennedy as his uh, introduction you know, to Jim Magalhaney. Uh, Eric was a, a member of our adjunct faculty for uh, quite a number of years, uh, and uh, he wanted to be here uh, for this program as well, but Eric is in Chicago in the middle of a big trial. Uh, so uh, he sent me a, a short note that he asked me to read on his behalf, and so here it is. I'm very sorry that I'm unable to attend this memorial program for Professor McElhaney. The fact is, I am doing exactly what he would have wanted. I'm in Chicago trying a lawsuit, employing all of the skills, techniques, and tactics that he taught me. The professor will always be one of the most influential people in my life. He pointed me in a direction and showed me a world that was intoxicating at every turn. His teachings were more than just textbook instructions. He inspired passion, excitement, and commitment. I have no idea where I would be today if he had not come into my life. But I'm quite sure I would not be in Chicago. So, thanks to Eric Kennedy. Uh, 
And now um, we will come back to the live speaker. Our next, uh, our next speaker is John Martin uh, from the class of 1984. John is also a longtime adjunct professor here. And let me turn the floor over to you now, John. Primus. How many times did he tell us primacy, the first thing you say, has got to be important? So the pressure's on. <laughs> Jim McElhaney had this ability to teach one morning, be on a plane that afternoon, talk someplace else, be back the next day. His students were totally prepared with all their materials. His guest adjunct had everything together, waiting at noon on Wednesday at that place on Bellflower for lunch. Meanwhile, while he's writing one article on Trial Notebook, he's got five letters going out, one to the Manhattan DA's office, one to the Department of Justice, one to the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor. Who else where for letters of recommendation? The man had the ability to be at Case Western Reserve and everywhere but Case Western Reserve, all at the same time. You would have thought he was two people in one, and he was. Arlene Riscoff, thank you for making me a better lawyer. <laughs> Mrs. H made those trains run, as Mark said. And to the McElhaney family, thank you for sharing your husband and your dad with us, because you gave him the opportunity to give us so much. But tonight's about the storyteller. And I am not leaving this podium until some of those stories get told. Because if you knew Jim, you knew there were stories. And he was the storyteller. Tonight is not just about the stories of the storyteller. Tonight's about the story of storytelling. The story of Jim McElhaney. If you went to law school in the 1980s, you knew about a movie called The Paper Chase. Mm -hmm. And the legendary Professor Kingsville, you come to me with your minds full of mush, and I teach you to think like lawyers. And I look in the back of this room today, and I see so many of the people for whom I'm so grateful because you taught me how to think like a lawyer. And Jim McElhaney taught me how to think like a lawyer too. And I took him for evidence for litigators and what Judge O'Malley said, look, making Judge O'Malley good in a courtroom, that's not that hard, she's really smart. But I walked into court from the very beginning and I always felt confident about the rules of evidence, too. Now, that's teaching. <laughs> Jim, and, and Jim could teach us how to teach like lawyers. My buddy Jerry McDonald from my class teaches uh, at Cooley Law School down in Tampa, Florida. Still uses one of Jim's analyses when it comes to the federal rules and how you plead in the alternative. You see, you had a, I lived in this house and I had a goat. The next door neighbor, he had a bunch of cabbage. One day the neighbor wakes up, the cabbage is all gone. He files a lawsuit against me. He says, your goat ate my cabbage. How am I supposed to respond? Asks McElhaney. Well, you did not have cabbage. If you did have cabbage, it was not eaten. If you did have cabbage and it was eaten, it was not eaten by a goat. If you did have cabbage and it was eaten, it was, and if it was eaten by a goat, it was not eaten by my goat. And if you did have cabbage and it was eaten, and it was eaten by a goat, and it was eaten by my goat, then my goat was insane. <laughs> he knew that the story, see, what Jim figured out, and what 
other professors knew but didn't have necessarily the same opportunity because Jim was a trial tactics professor, is that yes, you had to think like a lawyer, but you had to then communicate with the seventh grader. You had to communicate with people who were regular people, because those were your jurors. And he had that gift and he taught us to make sure that you could touch those people. And so he would tell you about the opening statement where the lawyer says, it was a contracts case. And he said, now ladies and gentlemen, you know this morning, I was uh, driving my son to work. He's nine years old. He saw that I had the suit on that I wear when I'm going to court. He said, daddy, what are you going to court for? I have a trial. What's your trial about, daddy? Well, I can't explain to a nine-year-old things like promissory estoppel, fiduciary duty, breach of contract. But he's a persistent little guy, so finally I said, okay, it's about somebody who made a promise. And then he didn't keep it. And ladies and gentlemen, the jury, that's what this case is about. And he took that ability to do that. And, and when he taught evidence, and he was trying to teach it. It's not for the truth of the matter. Think about the guy who's testifying saying, yeah, I shot him because he came at me with a knife, and he said, I'm going to kill you, you fat... Sophie, cover your ears for one second. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> and objection, hearsay. But, Your Honor, I'm not trying to prove my client is a fat bastard. This is not a probate case. Set off for his truth. And on we go. And so Jim realized that we learn through stories. And he taught through stories. But one of the things that I found as a student of Jim's was that he would regale you with stories for the purpose of teaching, but they were not his stories. He knew enough to know that if he sat in a classroom and told his own war stories, students would have turned him off. Good teachers know how to teach. Great teachers know how to make their students learn. There's a lot of great teachers in this room today. Jim was one of them. And so he would tell the stories of other people. Jim Jeans's story about when you're when your car is collided with that kid and your client is telling you, oh no, I was only driving 20 miles an hour, nobody's going to believe that. Don't slow down the car. Speed up the kid. <laughs> that story you can sell. And you would tell us these stories and we learned from these stories. Okay? But there was other parts of the story of Jim McElhaney that went just beyond teaching. The first time I looked at one of Jim McElhaney's books, I flip it open and I look at the dedication. I'm a student at Case Western Reserve. I never looked at dedications before. For some reason, I looked at this trial notebook. To Penny, Ben, and Dave. Because that was a part of the story. I remember being in trial, uh, trial team practice one night. It was getting late. McElhaney was getting a little anxious because he was supposed to be at his church, I think for choir practice. And he needed to get out, because that was part of the story of Jim McElhaney. And the lawyer that I run into when I'm trying cases in federal court in Alexandria, Virginia, and he finds out I'm from the Midwest, you start talking, he was from Chicago. The next thing you know, McElhaney. I had a night with McElhaney at the jazz piano at some bar in Chicago. You tell him I said hi. Because that was part of the story. And part of the story was him reaching into his pocket and handing my trial partner, Dave Kluver, a wad of cash and saying, when you finish that tournament this week, go out and have a good time. Because Jim enjoyed life. Did you ever notice he had that kind of weird kind of smile? Not weird, but that, that smile on his face. He'd walk around, kind of curled on one side a little bit. It's the kind of smile you see from a seventh grader who's just hidden Sister Henrietta's rosary and knows that she doesn't know where it is. <laughs> that he's getting away with something and nobody knows what it is. He was. He was getting paid to do stuff that he loved. And it showed. And it touched all of us. So in the process, the Jim McElhaney story, we all got to be characters in the Jim McElhaney story. And he got to be a character 
in the story of each of us, for some of us, a very profound character. Now, McElhaney didn't just talk about primacy, he talked about closings. He said, remember, you gotta take that theme from the beginning, you gotta bring it all the way through to the end, so that that nine-year-old who asked the questions about contracts, the lawyer gets up in closing argument, he says, Ladies and gentlemen, there was a little bit more to that story. As I let my boy off to school, he said, Daddy, can you do that? Can you make a promise and not keep it? And I said, well, that's going to be up to the jury, son. Well, the story of the storyteller, the story that is the storyteller, does it end today? No. The stories have to continue. They don't have to be our own. They can be each other's. But they continue as we ply our craft to juries. They continue as students are taught. They have to be shared. The only legacy for a teacher is that his students continue to learn, that his students continue to teach others. And we owe that to Jim McElhaney. Those stories that he told didn't just get told here. They got told in litigation magazines through the brief bag, that legendary bar at, in Trial Notebook. Someday I'm hoping that maybe there's this brief bag in heaven. I'm going to show up there, walk in. You're going to hear jazz piano music someplace in the background. Walk back, there's Jim tickling the items. And they're all there, all the great trial lawyers. Jim Jeans is there talking. Heck, they even let Irving, uh, they even let Irving in that. And he's sitting there and he's saying, really? Gosh, that's good, that's fantastic. Oh, that must have been wonderful. And the best part of that night, we're in heaven. We don't have to worry about any judges crashing the party. <laughs> and so thank you to Case Western Reserve for giving me a chance to say something tonight, especially in front of a group of teachers that I can look at. And I can tell you a story about every one of you <laughs> touching me as a student, and I really mean that. I, I look through the crowd, I said, yep, I can do it. Thank you to Case Western Reserve. Thank you for listening to me for way too long. And most of all, thanks to Jim McElhaney for giving me and so many others something to say. Godspeed. This is from Telly Nagos of the class of 1990. Uh, Telly was also in trial out of town, uh, but he wanted to be part of this program. So here we go. Western Reserve University School of Law. I not only had James McElhaney for my professor of evidence and trial tactics, but also worked very closely with him as he coached the all national mock trial team during my second and third years of law school. He was my advisor, my mentor, and clearly, clearly had the most significant impact on my career as a plaintiff's personal injury attorney. Most people came into contact with Professor McElhaney through reading his trial notebook, one of his various published articles, or sitting in on a lecture or seminar. From the outside looking in, it is easy to conclude that his artful storytelling, his creativity was so powerful that you think he was simply blessed from above. For those of us 
who got to know him well, those of us who got to know his heart, it was easy to understand and realize what fueled the brilliance, what fueled his blessing, was his genuine compassion for the relationship between the human spirit and the right to trial by jury. Professor McElhaney trained trial lawyers across the country how to artfully yet ethically advertise injustice, whether that would be righting a wrong on behalf of an injured plaintiff or recognizing the unfairness of having a defendant pay or accept responsibility for something he or she did not do. Well, let me just say this to all of you. I couldn't conclude tonight without sharing with you a McElhaney moment. When I was on the all my trial team, we would receive case packets, hypothetical cases, that would outline summary of facts, various evidence, have exhibits that you could mark and enter into evidence, discussion of law that applied with a given case. And these would shape the basis of our team conducting a mock trial. One year we had a criminal case. The defendant was alleged to have committed an armed robbery in a dilapidated apartment building. And the crux of the problem with this particular case was that there was not any evidence tying the defendant directly to the apartment. There was no DNA evidence, there was no physical evidence, and there was no eyewitness who saw him come or leave the apartment. However, there was one eyewitness who passed the alleged defendant when, they, when he was coming down the stairs and she was going up the stairs. I remember the description of the stairway as if uh, I read it yesterday. It painted a very dreary picture. The stairway was dark. It was unlit. It was narrow, dilapidated, with handrail going up only on one side, which was broken. And it went on to say that the handrail might or could move from the wall two to three inches when someone tried to grab it. The description of the problem also had a little footnote about the eyewitness who saw the defendant as she was going up the stairs. It painted her out to be an 86-year-old little lady, bad eyesight, who unfortunately had just lost her glasses earlier that morning and did not have them on when she passed the defendant on the stairway. So we broke up into our teams and over the next week or two worked on our cases in chief on behalf of the prosecution and the defense. And I thought we, uh, we knew we had it easy on the defense. We could smell reasonable doubt, we could taste reasonable doubt, we knew that the stairwell was unlit, it was dark. We knew that our little lady eyewitness didn't have her glasses and had bad eyesight, so we were fine with the defense, but we were struggling with putting together our case in chief on behalf of the prosecution. I remember one day I had a couple hours between classes so I went to the all mock trial room, of course. I, I peeked through the little rectangular window in the doorway to make sure no one was in there. Uh, went down, set my papers and my mock trial problem on, on the tables on the floor there, on the base level, and started working, hoping, hoping, uh, kind of praying that something would hit me to create some type of creativity on behalf of this issue. And Professor McElhaney uh, opened the door and stuck his head in and yelled out, Mackles, what are you doing here? And I told him we were struggling with the, uh, the prosecution's case. I think we had expressed that to him earlier in the week as well. And quite frankly, it was kind of whining. He said, you know, the facts just are so slanted. The facts, Professor McElhaney, you know, whoever wrote this problem, you know, didn't write it fairly. And the first thing he said to me was, one, trial lawyers don't whine. All right, so don't whine. Let me see the description of the stairwell. So I handed him the description of the stairwell, and he read it. And he looked at me and he said, Nachos, you know what my favorite meal is? I said, no, I don't. He goes, it's breakfast. Do you know why I like breakfast? Again, I said, no, Professor McElhaney, I don't. He said, I like to order pancakes. You know why I like pancakes? <laughs> Again, not knowing where he was going with this. He said, no, I, I don't know where he was going. He goes, let me tell you why I like pancakes, Nachos. 
No matter how you like your pancakes, maybe you like them fluffy and light and thick. Maybe you like them cooked a little bit more through thin pancakes. Maybe you like the little itty bitty silver dollar pancakes. No matter how you like your pancakes, they always got two sides. Just like every fact in every case that you will analyze on behalf of a real client when you leave this law school, every fact is like a pancake. It's always got two sides. And without hesitation, he said, now, about that stairwell. Yeah, I know it was dark and unlit, but doesn't that fact help you? Yes, your little old lady's going to say, it was dark and unlit, but you know what? Because of that, both she and the defendant were walking slowly as they passed. And he said, two, the description of the stairway is that it was a narrow stairway. In fact, the evidence will show not those that the stairway was so narrow that when two people passed each other, they practically brushed shoulders. And three, our little old lady's gonna testify she went up the stairway where the handrail was and she did grab the handrail. And when she grabbed it, the handrail did come out two to three inches and it forced her right into the defendant where she wasn't brushing him shoulder to shoulder anymore. Now she was eye to eye with the defendant. And four, who cares if the little old lady lost her glasses? When you have her up on the stand during direct examination, she's gonna explain she was nearsighted. She could see things close up, mighty high, if she just needed her glasses when looking at things at a distance. Only Professor Macklin could use his love for pancakes to teach one of the most, most important trial tactics concepts that quite frankly I have used in every single case I have worked on in my 29 year career as a plaintiff's personal injury attorney. Professor McElhaney, I know you're watching down from above tonight. I want to thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me personally. Thank you for what you've done for Case Western Law School, for what you've done to trial lawyers, for trial lawyers across this country. But most importantly, I want to thank you for what you've done for all of our clients. Because our clients have been the direct beneficiaries of the lessons that you have taught us. May God bless you, Professor <coughs> And to all those who are there in Cleveland tonight in the Altmont Tile Room, and particularly the McElhaney family, thank you so much for allowing me to share my thoughts with you. To the Altmont Trial Team, good luck. Good luck in regionals and take it to Texas. And may the memory of Professor James McElhaney be eternal. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Stephen Miller from the class of 1981. Steve? This is where it all began. In this room, in this semi godforsaken windowless half basement room, where we used to come day after day, week after week. I would never quarrel with Kate O'Malley, she's a federal court of appeals judge, and I'm not. But evidence for litigators, advanced evidence, trial tactics and the very first trial advocacy workshop he ever taught, team taught, with Ken Albers from Cleveland Playhouse. Four semesters, every week, two years, this room, Jim McElhaney, and I wasn't the only one. This made all the difference in the world. Arlene Risco, you get thanks and congratulations. They've said it, I have to say it too. Everybody who traveled in this universe knew that it was Jim McElhaney and Arlene Risco. To Penny and to David and to Ben, thank you. The attributions in the books that John Martin mentioned are true. Others of us have seen them and read them. 
we know that Jim read his articles out loud. Sometimes he did it to us on the telephone. The phone would ring, you'd pick it up. Miller, Magdalene, <laughs> listen to this. And we'd listen. And I didn't know then what was happening, but he was focus group testing his essay. He was looking to see if the words came off the tongue as well as they came off the pen. Because what he wanted was words that would get through. And if he couldn't say them, then he knew we couldn't read them. So to make those articles come alive, he read them out loud. And I know he read every one of them to Penny. And we talked about it. So she's the, she's the ghost behind all the editing. Before it was fashionable to talk about experiential learning, experience-based learning, experiential teaching, experience-based teaching, Professor Jim McElhaney was doing it on this floor right here. He figured something out early that we still wrestle with in strategic planning sessions at schools, colleges, and universities. Human beings we learned how to eat. We learned how to walk. We learned how to talk. And we didn't learn it from a textbook in a classroom. We learned how to drive. And we didn't learn it by reading a book and writing an essay. We learned it by doing, by informed doing, by reflective doing, by trial and error by reaction of others, by guidance from faculty or teachers or people who had done it before us and were more experienced. And he took that insight and he brought it to bear right here. And he got us up out of our seats and on our feet. Garrity was right. That was a faux pas. You can't sit. And he got us to open our mouths and to talk. And Garrity was right. You can't do it by reading your notes, but you can prepare. And by getting us up on our feet and talking in this room, he began to give us the exercises that would permit us to build the muscles, that would permit us to stand up and do it in any setting, any time. So whether you were a McElhaney protege and became a trial lawyer, federal court, John, plaintiff's personal injury, or you were a McElhaney student and took your law degree and did something completely different, the lessons apply. If you want to see the difference between things that are faddish and things that are timeless, pick up a Jim McElhaney essay from 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. They resonate today. He was doing little Pac-Man clamshells before Pac-Man was conceived. He was thinking about how to communicate before technology exploded. And if you go read the essays today, they apply to what we will do tomorrow, whether we practice trial law or something else. For me, it boiled down to five lifelong lessons. You've heard some pieces of some of them, and maybe you've heard all of them, but I gotta give them to you my way. One, think like a lawyer, talk like a person. Professor McElhaney complimented all of you in the back row who were teaching us new words, new concepts, new ways of speaking. But then he brought us in here and told us that we were gonna to have to tear that down in this room if we were gonna be effective in this room. And if this room was a prototype of where we were gonna end up, we would have to understand how to talk law to law audiences and how to talk life to non-law audiences. Think like a lawyer, talk like a person. The second, I think perhaps the greatest lesson of all, and he was so magnificent at this because in truth he embodied it, was that there was no Hollywood role model. This was not about 
chiseled features, six foot two, perfect frame, physical fitness, keeping a full head of hair for an entire life. <laughs> it wasn't about that at all. What it was was about being comfortable with being ourselves, finding and developing our own voice, pushing the limits and establishing our own style, and permitting ourselves to find ways to be effective by being ourselves. The third was, of course, his masterful use of stories. Tell stories, use analogies, create pictures in the minds of your audience. And he did do that. He modeled that for us and he prompted us to learn to do it and to find ways to do it. The fourth was this recognition that we would not be effective if we tried to tell people what to decide and why to decide in our favor. But that we could be effective if we helped trigger thoughts and feelings in our audiences that would cause them to reach their own conclusions. And if they reached their own conclusions, he knew those were the ones they would most firmly hold on to. And then either on their own, if they were a sole decision maker or an interaction with others, if they were a group decision maker, they'd be out persuading people on our behalf. And the last, not least significant by any stretch, was that the lawyer's credibility is always at stake, that our individual, professional, and personal credibility always matters. That when we're standing asking questions of the witness in the box, and we think that what matters is the witness's credibility, that's only a piece of the game, and the more fundamental credibility that's at stake in that room all the time, 24-7, on the record or off, is the lawyer's personal, professional, individual credibility. How do you do better? the that fistful of takeaways. There was a mention that we ought to keep the stories alive, and I hadn't thought of it until that mention, but there was a moment here that overtakes the idea of the pancake having two sides, and it had an amazing effect on Professor McElhaney. We had a classmate who, in her closing argument, walked up to the jury in this room right here and said, ladies and gentlemen, there are three sides to this case. <laughs> There's our side, which I've done the best job I can of showing you. There's our adversary side, which he's done an admirable job of showing you. And there's the truth, which is up to you to decide. <laughs> and Professor McElhaney couldn't figure out what to do. Half of them wanted to shake his head in disbelief that she just abandoned the notion that the truth was related to her piece of the case. And the other exploded in joy at the fact that she knew no bounds and she was pushing the envelope and she was trying to find her own way. So for me, I know that with that story, pancakes have three sides. <laughs> There was good mention, but because I'm fortunate enough to sit on the editorial board of Litigation Journal of the ABA section of litigation, I've got to take a moment to say it. Jim McElhaney published Trial Notebook in the very first, the inaugural issue of Litigation Journal. And he did it because he was invited to write it once. But he had a secret plot, and the secret plot was that he wasn't gonna write it once. The invitation was for him to be the editor who would then go out and solicit other trial lawyers to write each quarter. And he wouldn't have any of it. He wanted that column for himself, and he grabbed onto it, and he never let go. And although Professor McElhaney did a great job of keeping his ego in check sometimes, he didn't keep his ego in check all the time. <laughs> And one of the glorious manifestations of his ego was that he could walk around for 30 years and say that he was the only person who'd ever appeared in every issue of litigation journal ever published. We're now past that, 
and I actually have a colleague on the editorial board who likes to tell me that he has appeared more times than Jim McElhaney. But Jim was there from the start. And he really used the vehicle of the litigation section of the ABA to enhance our opportunities as case restraints or law students and to expand his own opportunities as a trial tactics evidence professor, lecturer, writer. His column then appeared every month, 12 times a year in the ABA Journal for over 25 years because the ABA Journal got jealous of the litigation journal and decided to better grab it for themselves. And they then ran repeats of old stuff because they didn't want to let go because people love to read it. And his books sold wildly, whether they were collections of columns that had already appeared or they were new essays that he wrote in, the litigation section still sells tons of McElhaney books. The, the truth is, we've got this really strange relationship with the memory of Professor Jim McElhaney. On the one hand, we already do, and always will, desperately miss him. And on the other hand, it's not about missing him. We don't miss him because it lives within us. And to walk in this room and hear others stand up and speak reflecting the experiences and the stories that so many of others of us have shared, this thing is going to resonate and bounce for a long time to come. So congratulations and thank you. Yes, it's true. Jim, we love you and we really appreciate you. Not so much or just for what you taught us, but much more for what you prompted us, helped us, and induced us to learn about ourselves, to learn for ourselves. So for some of us, you can call this room the alt moot courtroom. But for many of us, this is just going to be the McElhaney moot courtroom forever. Thank you. on the program, uh, my colleague and my former student, uh, Mike Benza. So I get to go last because the other McElhaney lesson was not just primacy, recency. recency. <laughs> I get recency. So learning by doing, show, don't tell. Theory of the case. Tell the story. Ultimately, with Jim, winning wasn't everything. In fact, winning wasn't anything. Learning was everything. One of the reasons that we are having this tonight, tonight is also the Alt Mock Trial Team Night. The national trial team that Telly was talking about is going to do their final run through and then leave for their competition. So we invite you all to stay after about 7 o'clock. Maybe we'll kick off and do demonstrate the legacy of Jim Mackling. I started my teaching here shortly after graduating by coaching the mock trial team. There's things that I learned from Jim when I was a member of the team I taught to my students. My students became the coaches after that. Their students became the coaches. We're three, four, five generations of students now coaching the mock trial team and they still use the stories. The goat, everybody knows the goat. The pancake story, the snow story for circumstantial evidence. Well, this case is circumstantial. Well, let me tell you about how this works, <laughs> members of the jury. We live in Cleveland. When you go to sleep, you look out your window and you see the grass and it's mush, and it's brown-green because it's January. But you go to sleep, and you wake up in the morning, and you look out the window, and it's white. 
and it's beautiful. Now, did you see it snow? <laughs> no. Did it snow? Of course. That's circumstantial. <laughs> we all know these stories. We all tell our students these stories. Telly tells the story of the pancakes in his trial. To this day, he remembers a case he did in mock trial 25 years ago, 28 years ago. He remembers that case. The impact of Jim continues. Those stories that he taught us, we use to teach. We use to talk to the jury because he taught us the best principle that comes with legal education and trial tactics. You don't tell people, you show them. And Jim's stories, his behavior, his will to make us understand by leading us in the classroom on how to do this stuff and to have an absolute blast doing it was what made his experiential learning program such a foundational thing for everything that we do today. And so to the McElhaney family, to Arlene, with a little story on Arlene first off, when we did this in the old days, Arlene was the keeper of the money. <laughs> so when mock trial would get ready to go to the competition, you'd go to see Arlene and she'd hand you an envelope full of cash. <laughs> a little note with a little clamshell on it that would say, good luck, the ball. So Arlene as well, thank you. To the McElhaney family, thank you so much. I hope we've given you some understanding and awareness of how much your dad meant to us, how much your husband meant to us, Penny. What a fantastic man he was, and what a tremendous influence he has and continues to have on the development of the young lawyers going forward. Thank you. Just ask if anyone else would like to say a few words about Jim. Uh, if you do, um, we would appreciate it if you could come down here. As I mentioned, the program is being webcast, and we want to make sure that you can be seen and heard. Johnson and I was in the class of 77 right. in this law school. And uh, as I entered my third year, someone told me, or several people told me, what a wonderful class Jim McElhaney's trial tactics class was. And he'd only taught here a year, so his reputation was uh, spreading like wildfire. I was not uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with the practice of law. I was a third year student. I took the trial tactics and uh, I was just really hooked. I just thought it was the most wonderful class and Jim was so uh, encouraging. There were only two women in the class. There weren't very many women litigators back in those days and there were two women in the class and uh, both of us loved it. And I decided this is what I was going to do. Even though I was not a theatrical type, I thought this is the practice of law. So um, I, I went out and eventually ended up in the US Attorney's Office, where I remained for 22 years. And every time I had a trial, uh, Jim's uh, directives, particularly the theory of the case and tell a good story, were always uh, in my mind as I prepared for trial or as I was in trial. Even your cross-examination, you, you advance that theory of the case. And uh, I, you know, just to have him in the back of my mind as I was trying cases was wonderful. I then went on to, he invited me back to the law school to, uh, you know, be a visiting litigator in his uh, his class. So I got to know him better then. You know, I had the lunches with him and uh, he, he actually encouraged me to uh, teach trial advocacy. And I really love that too. In fact, I think maybe I love that even more than uh, practicing law. So uh, after he left, 
I came back and for 18 years taught trial advocacy here. Um, one thing that I did that I picked up from Jim was I continued to have uh, sessions after the trial was over. We didn't have them here uh, like he did, but I had them at ho my house and had a dinner and we sat around viewing the videotape of uh, the class and critiquing these young people individually. And you know, to a person, they thought that this was a wonderful way to uh, go through the trial, because I didn't think they would see their videotapes after the trial was over. And they sat there, they saw their videotape. I basically adopted Jim's style about um, meeting with the small group of people after their trial, and it was, it was so effective, and they were so appreciative. Uh, since then, I've um, gone on to teach at the National Advocacy Center, which is the uh, uh, training school for the Department of Justice. And they were, uh, besides being an assistant U.S. attorney, they were impressed that I had taught here for 18 years, and also that I was a protege of Jim McElhaney. This was, <laughs> this was uh, very important to them. And backing up a little, when I first joined the department, um, I went to Washington for a training session, and um, their materials were all just like Jim McElhaney's as well. And I said, did he have any influence on your uh, developing this program? They said, oh yes, very definitely. So I don't know if it was the late 60s, early 70s, but he worked with the Department of Justice um, to develop their program. And so you see that uh, his, his uh, way of teaching continues to this day. And as, as I've gone down to Columbia to, um, to teach that course, I added his, his jury voir dire exercise with the poison pill. And we did a, we've done a Saturday morning session with these young people, which they absolutely love. Uh, that, was, that was something that he did at the beginning, but time constraints dictated dropping it out of uh, the program, but uh, it continues at the Department of Justice today. So his legacy lives on. Thank you. Oh, I do want to thank my way too, because through all the years, and certainly the 18 years of tr uh, teaching trial advocacy, you, you kept me on track, and all of us. Thank you. Okay, anybody else want to add anything? Okay, so. Yeah. I just wanted to say uh, thank you everyone for, for coming here. It was really neat to hear all the stories about dad and you know, from from my perspective, the, he was he was this guy who did all this stuff. But I thought, you know, that that was what everyone did. I thought everyone had all these lives, and that they were musicians, and they were teachers, and they were dads, and they worked on model airplanes and and uh, railroads. And I mean, he had all these interests and hobbies and passions, and uh, he was really passionate about teaching. And so he taught us, you know, throughout our lives. Uh, and, you know, he, he loved teaching here. And I remember coming to Cleveland. We came in, the I think, the winter of 1977 or, or fall of 77. So there was this giant blizzard after we got here. And we came from Texas, where he was at SMU. And I was, you know, walking around in bare feet and cowboy hats. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on here? This is amazing. And, and uh, Dan was so excited when uh, this room, I remember coming to this room, he was so excited about being here. He brought us down, he brought me and my brother here. And there was a, a video area and he showed us the video equipment and he said, this is gonna be so neat. I'm really excited about teaching the kids and we're gonna be able to videotape them. And he showed me all this neat video equipment and he was just so passionate about uh, teaching 
And it, you know, I know um, I, I really appreciate all of you sharing stories because he did share with stories. And Dan would be so honored. You know, I'm I'm really honored that you guys would take the time to come in and share stories because that's exactly what he loved doing. And uh, you know, I, I feel like that that he is here tonight because of all the people coming together and talking about him. I really feel his presence. So it's very special to me and my family. And thank you all so much. I really appreciate it.